sing and stand and sing God bless America. Stand as we sing. seated. Good morning, church. Good morning. Appreciate you having us over today and letting us participate in something we really enjoy doing. You know, there's only been two uh, divining forces ever offered to die for you. Jesus Christ and the American GI. One died for your soul. <laughs> These died for your freedom. I'm Hollis Gregory. Uh, before we get into what we really enjoy doing, I'd like to read a little story to you. It is a true story that goes back to World War II. During World War II, a U.S. Marine was separated from his unit on a Pacific island. The fighting had been intense, and in the smoke and the crossfire, he had just lost touch with his comrades. Alive in the jungle, he could hear enemy soldiers coming in his direction. Scrambling for cover, he found his way up a high ridge to several small caves in the rock. Quickly, he crawled inside of one of the caves. Although safe for the moment, he realized that once the enemy soldiers looking for him swept up the ridge, they would quickly search all the caves and he would be killed. As he waited, he prayed. Now I must narrate as to what an awesome God we serve. He prayed, Lord, if it be your will, please protect me. Whatever your will, though, I love you and I trust you. Amen. After praying, he lay quietly listening to the enemy begin to draw closer. He thought, well, unless, I guess the Lord isn't going to help me out of this one. Then he saw a spider begin to build a web over the front of the cave. As he watched, listening to the enemy, searching for him all the while, the spider layered strand after strand of web across the opening of the cave. Ha! Huh. What I need is a brick wall, and what the Lord has sent me is a spider web. God sure must have a sense of humor. As the enemy drew closer, he watched from the darkness of his hideout, could see them searching one cave after another. As he came to his, he got ready to make his last stand. To his amazement, however, after glancing in the direction of his cave, they moved on. Suddenly he realized that with the spider web over the entrance, his cave looked as if no one had entered for quite a while. He prayed again, Lord, forgive me. I had forgotten that in you a spider web is stronger than a brick wall. And I would like to uh, give my opinion, if I may, 
As to those who don't like to stand now for our national anthem, this is only my opinion, of course. I believe they should be asked, asked, of course, to walk through our national cemeteries and um, just look at the thousands upon thousands that have died for their right to stand. Now, while the guys are preparing to do our ceremonial fold, you know at military funerals, the 21-gun salute stands for the sum of the numbers in the year 1776. But have you ever noticed that the honor guard pays meticulous attention to correctly folding the American flag exactly 13 times? You probably thought it was to symbolize the original 13 colonies. That has nothing to do with it. We learn something every day. The first fold of our flag is a symbol of life. The second fold is a symbol of our belief in eternal life. The third fold is made in honor and remembrance of the veterans departing our ranks who gave a portion of their lives for the defense of our country to attain peace throughout the world. The fourth fold represents our weaker nature. For as American citizens, trusting in God is to him that we turn in time of peace as well as in time of war for his divine guidance. The fifth fold is a tribute to our country. For in the words of Stephen Decatur, our country in dealing with other countries, may she always be right, but is still our country, right or wrong, the sixth fold is for where our hearts lie. It is with our hearts that we pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The seventh fold is a tribute to the armed forces, for it is through the armed forces that we protect our country and our flag against all her enemies, whether they be found within or without the boundaries of our republic. The eighth fold is a tribute to the one who entered into the valley of the shadow of death that we might see the light of day. The ninth fold is a tribute to womanhood and mothers, for it has been through their faith, love, loyalty, and devotion that the character of the men and women who have made this country great has been molded. The tenth fold is a tribute to the Father, for he too has given his sons and daughters for the defense of our country since they were first born. The eleventh fold represents the lower portion of the seal of King David and King Solomon and glorifies in the Hebrews' eyes the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The twelfth fold represents an emblem of eternity and glorifies in the Christian's eyes God, the Father, the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. The 13th fold, or when the flag is completely folded and the stars are uppermost, reminds us of our nation's motto, in God we trust. In the folding, the red and white stripes are finally wrapped into the blue, symbolizing the light of day, vanishing into the darkness of night. After the flag is completely folded and tucked in, it takes on the appearance of a cocked hat, ever reminding us of the soldiers who served under General George Washington and the sailors and Marines who served under Captain John Paul Jones, who were followed by their comrades and shipmates in the armed forces of the United States, preserving for us the rights, privileges, and freedoms, and freedoms that we enjoy today. The flag is then presented to the next of kin on behalf of the President of the United States and a grateful nation. Thank you so much. I'd like for everybody to be seated, and if you are a veteran here this morning, uh, if you've served in the armed forces in any capacity, I'd like for you now to stand. Would you please stand? All right, I'd like for everybody else to look around you and see those folks that are standing, and be sure to thank them for their service. So, thank you. Thank you. God bless you. You may be seated. We want to welcome you to Beulah Baptist Church. It's so good that all of you could be here this morning on this Veterans Day weekend that we're observing as Veterans Day weekend. It's actually next Saturday, but we wanted to do that this weekend uh, to make sure that we did it before the holiday itself. So it's so good to see so many here. And we hope that you are blessed by this service today. If you happen to be a newcomer, uh, there's little blue cards in the pew rack, so if you just take that and complete it and put it in the offering plate as it comes by, that'll give us an opportunity to express to you how glad we were uh, to have you here uh, this morning. So let's uh, commit this service to God in prayer before we go any further. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning we are so grateful for all of our veterans. Father, we thank you for their sacrifice. We thank you for the hardship that they've endured. We thank you, Father, for the things that they teach us through their sacrifice and through their service. And Father, may they never forget that we are very grateful for the freedoms that we enjoy. And we know that they have played such a large role in us having those freedoms today because of their service to, to God and to country. Father, we pray that in every aspect of this service this morning that it would glorify you. We pray that through the singing, through the proclamation of your word, through the fellowship, that we would be drawn closer together to Christ and that we would be focused on him and that our lives would be pleasing in his eyes. And we do pray that if there is a person here this morning that does not know Christ as Savior, that that person would turn from his or her sin and would turn to Christ and experience the new birth that he has to provide. Father, we love you. We praise you. May every aspect of this service this morning bring honor and praise and glory to our Lord Jesus. For it's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing, He is Lord. Stand as we sing. <laughs>
time, Jay's going to come and share our announcements. As well, he's on his way. Shoe boxes are due today. If you forgot your shoe boxes, we will be across the road at 3.30 this afternoon. You can bring them there. If for some reason you can't bring them there, then you will need to call Brenda Rozier over at First Baptist and make arrangements for yourself to drop it off over there because we're gathering them all here today. We're going to load them up and take them all over there, and we're going to be done with them. So if you don't have it this morning, you can still bring it 3.30 across the road. And if you can't do that, then you need to call Brenda. And there's been questions about checks. If you want to write a check for your uh, shipping for your shoebox, make it out to Samaritan's Purse directly and either put it in your box or you can give it to Lisa or myself and we'll, we'll get it where it needs to go. Thank you. Morning. Good morning. All right. We've got our, uh, also going on with First Baptist there, we've got our uh, instant mashed potatoes. Are collect we're helping to collect uh, for the Thanksgiving baskets. So if you can help out with that, that would be wonderful. And then this week with Awana, the kids are wearing clothing that reflects anything God created. So be ready for that on Wednesday. And then, uh, let's see, on our, on our insert, we've got a big list of, where, where's the insert? There it is. Okay, so you got your November activities, but then also you've got the Child Protection Seminar that's coming up this evening. That'll be at 6 p.m. over in the Richard McDonald Ministry Center. So that is open to anybody. And remember that that's uh, just a real good informative stuff about, you know, things that we're trying to do to uh, make sure that we're protecting our kids and, you know, just being aware of everything in this sin-cursed world that we live in. So, uh, you know, if you can come out for that, that'd be great. If you're involved with some of our children's ministries, any of our outreach, this would be a real, real good thing for you to uh, get a, be aware of. So, you know, please, if you can, come on out for that 6 o'clock. Really looking forward to hearing, hearing that and just uh, hoping you know, to see what we can do there. Yeah, and child care will be available there, so um, no need to worry about that. All right, and then uh, also mark your calendars. We've got some dates here for uh, our, uh, our walkthrough nativity that we have. That'll be December 1st and 2nd, so you can know that they'll be uh, asking for volunteers to help out with that soon, and then each night they'll be uh, looking for, uh, for cookies, so uh, be ready for those sign-up sheets. December 3rd is going to be our, our family holiday dinner at 5 p.m., so uh, get that wrote down. And then December 17th will be our Christmas program here. And then December 24th, our Christmas Eve service. So be ready for all that. Okay. What else we got? We've got some pictures. Now these were from the women's retreat. Does any of the ladies here want to talk about that? Who was, I, I was able to get uh, Sally Pickens in the first service. I don't have any idea about these. No, Rosemary, are you going to talk about them? Oh, come on over here now. You got to get to the mic. Over here, you got to get to the mic. Yeah, they can't hear you. It's for the recording. <laughs> I've got lots of pictures. Okay. This was a craft that all of the ladies did. The one was we wrote down our favorite scripture. The one on the left was that one. We kept that one. The other one was for each lady to write a prayer request on. And then at the end of our day yesterday, we each picked up one of the right flip-flops and took it home. And that is someone that we pray for. We are to pray for those prayer requests. Okay. And then there's other pictures. You can, I don't know how to talk about all these. Okay. That's just some of the ladies there. Yeah. <laughs> They'll just, yeah. There we go. Oh, uh, well, that was the sisters in law. Yeah, these are just some pictures of the ladies that were here. We had a real good time. Was had. Yeah, so real, real good time was had by all. Yep, yep. This is just some of the ladies that were. Those shirts are the ones that you heard us talking about ordering. The ones um, there that Mary has on. Several of us had those. Now, now Sally did become, she said in the early service that she now has appreciations for Jerry taking pictures because nobody was wanting to cooperate. <laughs> Look, Betty's not looking up there. We, yes. <laughs> we were supposed to get a group picture, and you'll find out that never happened. Try to get a bunch of ladies together, right, Jerry? <laughs> so, Jerry, there's a new appreciation for you. Maybe we're glad you weren't there yesterday. 
All right, moving right along. Okay, birthdays. <laughs> Matthew Enzi, Reagan Taylor, and Connie Castle. No anniversaries this week, so uh, happy birthday, happy anniversary. And then our scripture reading will come out of the book of Judges, and Jason's going to come and read that to us. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, looks like we got Judges 6, 11 through 14. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak of Ophrah and belonged to Joash, an Abazrite, where his son Gibeon was thrashing the wheat in the winepress to keep from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where were all his wonders that the ancestors told us about and what they said? Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of the Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in strength and have and be saved and out of the Midian's hands and I am not sending you. God bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Jason. If our ushers will come, we'll take up our morning offering. Jerry Eisner, if you could pray for forgiveness, I mean, the offering.
this time we have a special from the choir. For he was proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved, and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy gold refine. Thank you, choir. Let's take our hymnals and turn to 231, and we'll let the kids go ahead and go downstairs for junior church. Number 231, Jesus Saves. Stand as we sing. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus Joy plays the next verse. We'll let the choir go down and you get around and greet one another this morning.
And the last verse. Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hill and deepest caves. This our song of victory. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Amen. You may be seated. Nothing like good Christian fellowship. Just nothing beats that. All of the handshakes and the hugs and, and the smiles. You don't get that if you stay at home and watch a preacher on TV. So, and I understand some folks can't get out, and that's, that's a totally different story. But if you just don't want to get out and you just stay home, you miss all this. And so that's why the Lord encourages us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Because we need the hugs and we need the, the presence of one another. Okay, that's another sermon. Um, Prayer uh, time. Uh, we're coming to that now, and uh, so we want to remember uh, all of those who are ill in our church congregation and those who are associated with it, uh, that God would just provide healing for them, strength and comfort. Uh, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man or a woman avails much, as James 5.16 says. Uh, and so we want to pray and ask God to move uh, in these people's lives. We want to pray for those who are lost. Uh, that God would uh, work in their lives, would use us as well as others to bring them to a knowledge of the Savior. And especially as we are recognizing veterans this morning, we want to pray for our country. Um, we need to pray for our nation. We need to pray for a great awakening. We need to pray that men and women, boys and girls, will turn to Christ in large numbers. That's really the ultimate solution for us, uh, is for folks knowing Christ. Uh, and so we're so thankful for all that our veterans have done and the things that they've, they've provided for us. Um, but we also want to, most of all, honor God with the things that we've been entrusted. Uh, previous generations have sacrificed so much. So let's give God thanks above all and honor him and repent of, of the sins that we've committed. We need to repent as a, as a country as well. And so let's just pray for God's awakening upon our land. Pray for those folks by name. Uh, that are lost, that God would work in their lives. And just pray for, for our church, that God would guide us as we do outreach efforts and seek to win others to Christ. Um, so just lift up various concerns to the Lord and also thank him uh, for the wonderful things that he's done for the land in which you live, for the freedoms that you enjoy, and most of all, for the new life in Christ. Uh, so let's just take a few moments and have private meditation. Then after that, we'll be led in our prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, this morning we give you praise and honor for so many good things in our lives. Father, as we honor our veterans, we do thank you once again for them. But we also thank you for the country in which we live and for the, the grace that you bestowed upon us. Father, as our country has gone through various times of conflict, when our freedoms have been threatened, we do thank you for all those veterans who put their lives on the line, but we also thank you for your gracious provision. For because we know that there are many incidents in which we prevailed, in which we would not have prevailed, 
had it not been for your guiding and protecting hand. And so, Father, this morning we ultimately honor you and we give praise and thanks to you in all your goodness and greatness. We pray, Father, that you would use us as your instruments and we ask that in every area of our lives that Christ would be glorified. We pray, Father, for those who don't know Jesus, that you would use us to reach out to them and make an eternal difference in their lives. Grant us the boldness that we need to live a strong witness in this age of increasing darkness. May our light for Christ be bright in all that we say and everything that we do. May our lifestyles speak Jesus to others. And may our words also communicate his gospel. Father, we pray this morning that you would just guide us as a congregation, that we will be very sensitive to the promptings and the leadings of your Holy Spirit. May we always be grounded in your word, governed by your spirit, and move forward by the plan that you have for each one of us to reach out and to make a difference in those lives around us. Father, we pray this morning that you'd minister to unspoken requests that are here, that you would provide for those needs as only you can. For those who are ill, we pray that you grant healing to their bodies. For those who have other concerns, we pray that you'd minister in those situations. And Father, we pray that you'd forgive us of our sins. For those things that we're not doing, that we should be doing, Father, grant us your mercy. And Father, for those things that, that, we, those things that we're neglecting, those things we should be doing, the things that, that we aren't doing, that we should, Father, we, we pray that you would just forgive us of those things and lead us closer to you. Father, we ask this morning that as your word is open, that it would speak to our hearts and minds, that it would remind us of the way in which you would have us to live and the call that you've placed on each one of our lives. Father, we ask that you would just minister to anyone here this morning who doesn't have new life in Christ. For anyone who's not asked Jesus to forgive him or her of their sins, Father, may today be the day of salvation for that person. May they say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I'm turning from trying to do things my own way. I surrender my life now to Christ. Save me and give me the new life that only you can provide. Father, may you be honored as your word is proclaimed this morning. And we know that your word as it is shared will not return void, but it will accomplish the purpose for which it's sent. So Father, speak to us now. Our minds are open, our hearts are receptive. Lead us in the way that you would have us to go. For it's in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Master, and our soon coming King that we pray. Amen. Judges chapter 6, verses 11 through 24 is our passage for this morning. You heard a por portion of that earlier. So if you turn to Judges 6, if you're not already there, you can follow along as I begin going through the passage this morning. As you're well aware, this weekend is, is the weekend that we're uh, recognizing the brave men and women who have served in the U.S. Armed Forces, and it's especially good to have all of our, our visitors here with us this morning. Veterans Day is next Saturday, November the 11th. I always remember Veterans Day, and I remember it for more than one reason. My father was a veteran of World War II. He served in the Air Force. He had great pride in that. He was very proud of his country. He was greatly, appreciated, greatly appreciative of all of the men and women who served in the armed forces along with him and those who served after him. Well, he died suddenly on November the 8th, 1987, and he was buried on Veterans Day, November the 11th, 1987. So that day always has a, a mixed set of emotions for me. But this national holiday recognizes men and women who have defended their country at home and abroad. For the veterans who are here today, again, let me just thank you for your service. I don't think really we can say that enough, so thank you uh, for your service. In this morning's passage, there's a description of an ancient soldier by the name of Gideon. He was sent into service not by the government, but he was sent into service by Almighty God. 
Around the world today, there are wars, there are rumors of wars. North Korea is testing their nuclear capabilities. Iran is a hostile nation to the West. Terrorism is an ever-present threat, as we've seen just in the New York City attacks recently, several days ago. The reason for all of this hostility is not just one hostile tyrant. It's not just a band of militant groups. The reason for all the unrest in the world today is ultimately because of sin and because of Satan. That's, that's the root cause of all of these things that we see manifested. The only person who can provide a true and lasting peace is Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Until he returns to rule and to reign, there is going to be conflict here and there and other places. We're thankful for our armed forces who help settle those things down and bring as much peace as possible. But until he returns, there is always going to be unrest, and there's always going to be a sense of spiritual conflict occurring all around you. Not only is there physical conflict, there's spiritual conflict. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Last Sunday night, during the men's fellowship, the the men were discussing how they could step up and be greater spiritual leaders in their homes. Now that discussion's been weighing on my mind since then because that's something that I want to do. I want to be a better spiritual leader in my marriage and in my home and certainly in the church. But the questions then start coming, how can you be, as a man, a stronger spiritual leader for your wife, for your children, and even your grandchildren? How does all that come together? I mean, it's, it's easy to say, but how does all that actually work in your life? How can you be a greater spiritual leader in the church as a man? How can the rest of you as women and youth and children support the men in that process? Well, in this morning's passage, there's an account of a man who was transformed by Almighty God. Now, to give some context here, the people of Israel, they were being oppressed by the Midianites, and obviously this period was under the Judges, it's in the book of Judges, and when one judge of Israel would arise to, to deliver the people from oppression, and there was a cycle that took place here, the people would have a judge that would arise, he or she would deliver them, and then there'd be a period of, of prosperity, and there'd be a period of blessing, and then in that time of prosperity and blessing, they would get lax, and they would begin drifting from God. And then after a period of drifting from God, the oppression would begin again. And they would find themselves in the midst of extreme hardship. And after that extreme hardship had gone on for some time, then they would cry out to God for a deliverer. Then after crying out to God, God would send them a deliverer. They would be delivered. They would be freed from their oppressors. They'd have a period of freedom and prosperity again. And then the oppression would start as they drifted from God. So there was this cycle that takes place in Judges. And you see this cycle again and again. And if we are not careful today as believers, we can fall into that same cycle. Because our greatest temptation is not really when we're under hardship, when we're under fire, when difficult times are on. It's when we have periods of immense prosperity. It's then we're tempted to stray from God. It's, temp it's then we're tempted to think we're the ones that caused it all rather than God providing it to us. And so our thinking gets muddled. We drift from God's word. We drift from his commands. And sooner or later, we find ourselves oppressed under all kinds of difficult circumstances. We cry out to God. We're humbled. God delivers us. And then that same thing can start. Well, anyway, in this morning's passage, there's an account of a man named Gideon who was transformed by God. God touched him, God worked in his life in a powerful way. The people of Israel here are oppressed by the Midianites and the Amorites. They call out to God for help. So God calls Gideon as his man to help them and to deliver them. Verse 12 says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Now, if you've got your Bible, just, just take that verse and look at that verse for a second. If you don't have your Bible open, open your Bible. And, and follow along with me. If, you, if you've got it on your phone or something, follow along on your phone. Uh, whatever it is, follow along. So verse 12 says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Now these words are amazing. The reason they're amazing, they're not only in God's word, that makes them amazing, but they're also amazing because Gideon was anything but a man of valor. 
Valor, by the way, is defined by Webster's Dictionary as follows. Strength of mind or spirit that enables a person to encounter danger with firmness, personal bravery. When you read through the account of Gideon's life, he is not a man of valor. He's fearful, he's timid, and many would call Gideon a wimp based upon the description that you find here of his life. So the natural response to God's plan of calling Gideon to lead is to think, God, you've got to be kidding. Gideon? Gideon is no mighty man of valor. Gideon is no warrior. He's plagued with fears. And this passage describes all of his fears. And when it comes to, to you as a man today, being the spiritual leader for your wife or your children or your grandchildren or your church, you may think, who, me? Me? I, I can't be a spiritual leader for my wife or my kids or my church. I, I'm, I, God, you've got the wrong person here. Surely you're calling other people, but you're not calling me. But the thing to grasp here in this story of Gideon and in your life today is that God doesn't see as other people see. God sees things differently. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So when God looked at Gideon, he didn't see his outward appearance. God saw his heart. God saw the potential there of a leader. And when God looks at you as a Christian man, he doesn't see who you are right now. He sees who you can be as you surrender your life to him, as your life is governed by his word, as your heart and mind and character are transformed by his spirit. He sees what you can become with divine intervention. And that's a powerful thing to grasp. So when God looks, ladies, when God looks at your husband, he doesn't just see that guy that may really frustrate you now. He sees potential in him. He sees a character that he wants to develop. He sees godly courage that he wants to bring to the surface. When God looks at your dad, teenagers or, or even uh, adults here, when he looks at your dad, your Christian dad, he doesn't just see him with all of his faults. He sees him as the man he can become. When God looks at any of the saved men in this church, he sees potential there. He sees things he wants to do. And as you, as a Christian man, when God sees you, he's calling you to be the man that only you can become under his leadership, under his direction, and with his transforming power. So there are four sets of fears here that Gideon, this mighty man of valor, which he was anything but that, there, there are four sets of fears that Gideon works through as, as God is dealing with him. We're going to cover the first two sets today, and we'll cover the next two sets next Sunday. So first of all, God made Gideon a man of valor despite his fears about God's love. God made man, Gideon a man of valor despite fears about God's love. Listen to verses 11 through 13. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abazarite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that his, our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of of Midian. Why has all this happened to us? Where are your wonderful deeds from the past? God, why have you forsaken us? In other words, Lord, don't you care for, for me now? You cared for, for me and you cared for my people in the past, but now it seems like things are different. I look back to the good old days. I remember how great things were then and how you provided then. But now, in this present time, it just seems like you don't care anymore because things are so different and life is so hard. Gideon is fearful that God has left him and his people. Now, today you may feel as if God has left you. Your body isn't as strong as it used to be. Your job isn't what you thought it would be when you first took it. So now things are quite different. Your marriage has problems. Your children don't obey you. Your grandchildren don't spend enough time with you. 
and you're trying to take care of your mom and dad, perhaps, and they're giving you fits because they just don't cooperate. And their parents are kind of like that as you're trying to take care of them and provide for them. Um, you can't seem to accomplish much in the church when you take on a special project. So things aren't going that well. Lord, I'm afraid that you don't care for me anymore and my family like you used to do back in the day. Don't believe the lie that God doesn't care for you. God does care for you as a Christian man. God is very much concerned about you. He sees what's happening in your life, and he's able to make a difference. Romans chapter 8 says, God works all things together for the good of those who love him. God has not changed. The same God that was blessing back in the past is the God that is with you in the present. Just because things may be difficult now doesn't mean that God doesn't care for you. It also means that God hasn't blessed you even in the midst of hardship you have. God can bless you and God can provide for you even in the midst of hard times. So troubles here have a way of being less intimidating when you get a divine perspective on them. So the angel of the Lord is offering that perspective, that godly perspective to Gideon. And the truth of God's word offers you that perspective today. Don't fall for the lie. Be into God's word. Be re rooted in God's word and believe what it says that the Lord cares for you. And he's able to make a difference in your life. Hebrews 13, 6 says, so we can confidently say the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? God made Gideon a man of valor despite fears about God's love. And God can do the same with you as a Christian man today as you entrust your life to him. Second, the second set of fears that the Lord tackles in this passage were about his plan. They were about his plan. God made Gideon a man of valor despite his fears and his concerns about God's choice. Listen to verses 14 through 16. And the Lord said to him, or the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites with one man. God makes it clear here to Gideon what he is to do, and Gideon tries to argue with God that he's picked the wrong guy. And this, this is the essence of what he's saying. So just listen to kind of the, the David Best paraphrase of this. I come from a long line of weaklings. I'm also the puniest one in my whole family. I just can't do it, God. I'm not up for the job. Have you ever had that kind of conversation with God as a Christian man? You probably wouldn't admit it. I'll admit it. I've had that kind of conversation with God. But you may be thinking along the lines, well, I'm not very spiritual. My father wasn't very spiritual. My grandfather wasn't very spiritual. We're just that way. We're just not very spiritual. And my wife knows more about the Bible than I do. Come to think of it, my kids who go to Awana, they know more about the Bible than I do. Me, a spiritual leader for my wife and my kids? God, you've got the wrong person. It's the same kind of thing. But yet God has called you to do that, and what God calls you to do, he enables you to do. And so when you submit your life to him and when you follow that God calling, God will work through you, and he will bring you up to the task, just as he did with Gideon. Friend, it doesn't matter what kind of assessment you make of your life, as a Christian man, God has called you to be a servant leader, one who sets the pace for your wife and for your children. That's not an optional thing. That's what God has called you to do. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Man, that's servant leadership. That's, that's powerful stuff. Ephesians 6.4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. If you are a man and you have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, that call from God is for you. You're not exempt from that. To love your wife as Christ loved the church, that's the essence of spiritual leadership in a marriage. 
to raise your children in the discipline and in the instruction of the Lord. That's the essence of being a godly father. Now, you may say, well, I'm not married and I don't have kids or my, my life's not fitting in that pattern. But even if you aren't married and even if you don't have children, your calling is to be a male role model in the church of which you are a part. Now, you may say, well, pastor, I, you don't understand. I, I just I can't do all those things. I mean, I know what the scripture says, but I just can't do that. You know what? I can't do them either. Nobody can do those. No man can do them without God's help. But when God works, when you turn your life over to God, that very little that is your life becomes much because God takes it, he blesses it, he multiplies it, and he uses it to be a tremendous blessing to your family and those around you. God made Gideon a man of valor despite his fears about God having made the wrong choice. When it comes to you as a Christian man, God has not made the wrong choice in calling you to be a spiritual leader for your wife, for your children, and for all those other believers around you. So this morning, if you're a man here in this congregation, God's plan, first of all, for you is to be saved. If you do not know Christ as your Savior, you can't be a spiritual head of your family. You can't be a spiritual leader in your marriage. You can't love your wife as Christ loved the church because you have not been born again. You need to know Jesus Christ, and you need to turn from your sin, trying to do things your own way, and say, Lord, forgive me of my sin, come into my life, and make me a new person. You need to be saved. As Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Once you are saved, then God's plan for you is to be a servant leader to the people around you. It may not be your plan for you, but it's God's plan for you. For the rest of of, of for the rest of you, for everybody else here, your calling is to pray for the men in your life. Well, preacher, I'm sure you're so glad you said that because my husband needs prayer. Or, you know, I'm, the teenagers may be saying, yeah, my dad needs prayer. I mean, he needs a lot of prayer. I mean, it's a mess. So, but seriously, pray. God can make a difference when you pray and when you make that the focus of your prayers. Don't sell God short. And what he can do. He can keep his word. He does honor his word. And so pray for those men in your life who are Christians. Encourage them. Respect them. Empower them to be the servant leaders that God has called them to be. And you may say, well, well preacher, that's just not possible. With God, all things are possible. Gideon was a weakling. And yet God, it, read the rest of Gideon's story. The, the, the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey says, it is a powerful thing. God used him despite all of his weaknesses and despite all of his fears. And God can use that Christian man in your life as you lift him up to God in prayer and as you encourage him and you respect him in the midst of all that. Gideon, as weak and as doubtful as he was, be became a mighty man of valor because he surrendered his life to God's plan, and they allowed God to work his work of transformation in him. So this morning, will you respond to God's calling as, as a Christian man? Will you respond to God's calling as an unsaved man and be saved from your sin? The rest of you, will you, will you respond to God's calling and praying for those men in your life and encouraging them and asking God to do what only he can do, but what he desires to do? The choice of whether or not you respond to God's call is yours this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this example of Gideon. Father, we look at his life, we hear his concerns, we um, understand that he just he wasn't much of a mighty man of valor at all. He he was scared. He was he was unsure of himself. He was unsure of everything in his life. But yet you were able to use him as, as a mighty man of valor. And we see that as his life unfolds. You made the difference. And Father, just as you made the difference in the life of, of this man in the book of Judges, so you can make a difference in the lives of men today. Father, we pray for those men here who don't know Christ as Savior. Father, the greatest thing that we can do to be a stronger man, to, to be more masculine, to be... Uh, more of, of the, the man that you would have us to be is to accept Christ and to allow him to save us of our sins and to bend our knee before the Lord Jesus. 
and allow him to transform our lives. Father, the rest of us here who are Christian men, the greatest thing that we can do is to surrender ourselves to your call and to be the servant leader that you'd have us to be with our wives, with our children, and in our church. And Father, for the rest of us here, may we be faithful to pray. May we be faithful to encourage. And may we be faithful to do all we can to help folks to, to follow after the plan that you have designed for them. For it's in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, that we pray. Amen. If you're here this morning and you need to make a first-time decision for Christ, I want to invite you to come uh, during our hymn of invitation. We're going to sing the first and the last verses of Only Trust Him 2, 52. Uh, but if you're here and you don't know Christ, I want you to come publicly. And I'll be glad to pray with you. We, we have others that would be glad to pray with you as well. If you need to rededicate your life to Christ as, as, a, as a, a man of, of God um, or as, as someone else here that needs to rededicate your life to Christ, you're encouraged to come publicly and to do that so everybody else will know for sure where you stand. If you'd like to become a part of our congregation officially, come and we'll discuss that and pray about it. But will you respond to God's call this morning? Let's, let's uh, stand as we sing. 252. <laughs> Tony McDaniel, would you close us in prayer, please?